Rediscover God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is Real Bible Study with teacher Tom Bradford. Welcome to Torah Class. The last time we were together, we had an introduction to Obadiah, smallest book in the Old Testament. Now it's one chapter, 21 verse prophecy might seem to be insignificant in the face of a massive book of prophecy like Ezekiel or Jeremiah or Isaiah with its 66 chapters and scores of thousands of words. Now, I hope to show you that the minor prophet, Obadiah, has much value and brings needed information um, about just what's over the horizon in world history. And this is because it's subject matter directly concerns the period of time we have likely entered or stand upon or have taken the first step over the threshold into the end times. The entire subject matter of Obadiah is Edom. But Obadiah is hardly the only prophetic book to deal with Edom and what God has in store for these descendants of Jacob's twin brother Esau. And we're going to bring some of those other prophet, those other uh, prophetic books into play as we go along. Now we left off in the first verse of Obadiah, and I want to return to it. So to begin Obadiah, we have the sentence. Hazon Oved Ko Amar Adonai Olevi Le Edom, which translated into English is Obadiah's vision, thus spoke the Lord Jehovah to Edom. Now consider this carefully. All right. God did not speak this to Obadiah, nor did he give Obadiah an instruction to take this message to Edom. Or to the nations. Rather, we are told Jehovah spoke this to Edom and to the nations. How are we to understand this? Well, the second half of the verse, verse one says, as a messenger being sent among the nations saying, Come on, let's attack her, we heard a, we heard a message from Adonai. So while the entirety of verse 1 is kind of a riddle to unpack, it's this last half of verse 1 that is the real issue. Who is this messenger being sent among the nations? It says, come on, let us attack her, meaning attack Edom. Then who is the we that is listening to this message from God? We who? I'm going to say right up front that there are at least two or three reasonable interpretations. And while I lean towards one of them, by no means am I rigid, rigid about it, because these words are just too cryptic to be certain. But before I address this, here is what can be noticed. Obadiah is not being spoken to by God. God is also not giving Obadiah an oracle to deliver to the leadership of Israel as happens with some prophets. Rather, Obadiah is given a vision that clearly is meant for him to write down for posterity. That is, Obadiah is being allowed to see and hear something that's going on. But it doesn't really involve him. For lack of a better illustration, think of a court reporter. Okay? A court reporter is in no way part of the proceedings. Nothing about what is going on involves her. That person's only job 
is to be silent, a good listener, almost invisible, and to faithfully record what all the parties say in order that an accurate record of it can be made for future reference. So Obadiah is but a witness to God speaking. But to whom is God talking? Or is this speech a kind of grandiose God speak that is merely revealing his mind about something and is only speaking rather theatrically to no one in particular? Now, for me, it certainly seems as though someone else must be present, even maybe more than one someone. It also seems that since God dwells in heaven, then these words he is speaking are being directed directed to someone there and not on earth. So if he's actually speaking to someone, then unless this is kind of a fantasy speech or rhetorical, then this someone can only be a spiritual being. I know I'm using words that are a bit elastic, but that's the best we can do with the information we've been given. It's my leaning that God is likely talking to his divine council of Elohim, spiritual beings that lives in heaven with him. Perhaps it's with some high ranking angels instead. Now, so that you know what I mean by divine counsel of Elohim, I'm going to take just a moment to explain it. Go to Psalm 82 in your Bibles if you have it handy. Psalm 82, and I want you to follow along with me because I want you to keep this page kind of earmarked in your Bibles. Psalm 82. Starting at verse 1, a psalm of Asaph. Elohim stands in the divine assembly. There with the Elohim, he judges. How long will you go on judging unfairly, favoring the wicked? Give justice to the weak and fatherless. Uphold the rights of the wretched and the poor. Rescue the destitute and the needy. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. They don't know. They don't understand. They wander around in darkness. Meanwhile, all the foundations of the earth are being undermined. And my decree is, you are Elohim, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you'll die like mortals. Like any prince, you will, rise, you will fall. Rise up, Elohim, judge the earth, for all the nations are yours. Oh, wow. See, this psalm tells us something that can be a little bit unsettling. Because only rarely is it ever even talked about, except in theological academic circles. It is that the scriptures claim that in heaven there is a divine assembly or divine council of high category spirit beings that God instructs or in some way collaborates. And they clearly are there to deal with the nations of the earth, as well as to be sort of the administration class of beings over heaven. And in this psalm, God is giving them a good dressing down because the, some of them are not doing right. Some have been corrupted. And they are going to pay the price for their evil, for willfully defying God's will by dying like mortals instead of living eternally. Now let's take this another step. In Genesis, we get this strange verse. Genesis 126. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image and the likeness of ourselves and let them rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the animals all over the earth, every crawling creature that crawls on the earth. Now I call it strange because clearly God's talking to somebody about making humankind. 
Now, the church has for centuries claimed that this is God speaking to the Trinity. That is, one attribute or person of God talking to another attribute or person of God. But this is an idea that's nowhere present in the Old Testament. In other words, the accepted tradition in Christianity is God is essentially talking to his plural self. Now, I challenge this notion because nowhere else in the Bible do we have a conversation between God and another self in heaven. Rather, a much better alternative is that he was speaking to his divine counsel of Elohim in heaven, which we are told exists there. So back to Obadiah verse 1. I think the we that we find here is the same as the us in Genesis 126. And why would we expect otherwise? It is God again speaking to his divine counsel, and this time he's telling them what he wants done to Edom and the nations, and why. I mean, think of it this way. Who is going to tell the governmental leaders of the many individual nations of the earth to come, let's attack Edom? Obadiah? Certainly not. I mean, Obadiah won't be living in the end times. Besides, he isn't being asked to do that because he isn't even part of the conversation that's going on in heaven. Not only that, it's hard to picture a couple of hundred humans and the leadership of the world's nations all spontaneously, each of their own accord, having the same idea, adopting the same mindset at the same time. Rather, the only way this can happen is with an outside spiritual influence. And since we're told in the Bible that there is a divine being assigned to each nation, and how exactly a divine being deals with his assigned nation, I don't know. And with a very good example of this, by the way, recorded for us in Daniel, then it is logical that what we are reading about in verse 1, according to what Obadiah is hearing and recording, are those divine beings of the divine council being assigned the duty to foment the world leaders to act in concert to attack Edom. But not until a certain time or times in history arrives. Let's move on. To preface what comes next, let's put some things in perspective. Esau, the founder of the nation of Edom and Edom itself, were at first not spoken of in the Bible as inherently negative or wicked. Early on in Genesis, although Esau was deceptively disinherited by Jacob as the firstborn of Isaac, nonetheless, Esau, Esau was not cursed. And while it's true that the land Esau was destined to settle in was largely arid, located mostly south of the Dead Sea, both to the east and west sides of it, there was wealth to be had in it, copper at first. And it had sufficient arable land and water and grazing areas for Esau and his descendants to grow and to prosper. And let's also be clear that even very early on, not all the people who formed the nation of Edom were even descendants of its founder. And this can be said for any nation and people. The issue about Edom is that beginning with Esau, there was a prickly relationship between the twin brothers, Jacob and Esau. Jacob feared that Esau would retaliate for the birthright matter and be his enemy. 
But Esau comforted Jacob, and they reconciled to a degree such that they were certainly not close as brothers, but neither were they violent adversaries. However, as time went on, the adversarial nature of their personal relationship and then that of the two nations that they spawned increased to the point that when Jacob's descendants fled Egypt, Edom refused to even allow them to pass through their land to get to Canaan. So as time passed and the era of the prophets began, we find them talking about Edom and the talk moves from being merely prickly to negative. That is, the issue of Edom not being part of the covenant people, a status that was handed down from Abraham to Isaac and then from Isaac to Jacob, it creates this definite division and distinction. And so the prophets begin to portray the relationship between Israel and Edom as us versus them. The negative view the prophets present in their writings escalates severely. When Edom makes the unwise, the faithful decision to aid and assist Babylon against Judah. This now turns Edom into a downright enemy, and it puts them in the same category as Babylon. That is, Edom and Babylon become not only wicked adversaries of Israel and therefore of God, but they also begin to be portrayed as types. They are sometimes depicted as representative types of all Gentile nations in general. Therefore, because of what Edom did in helping Babylon against Judah, Edom has written its own epitaph of doom and destruction. And in Obadiah and in other prophets such as Jeremiah, this issue of the Edom-Babylon connection is used as the rationale for God's wrath being unleashed upon Edom. Then the issue becomes, when will this wrath come upon Edom? And as far as is typical of prophecy, often the prophetic action happens, then it happens again, far later into the future. And in a bit of a spoiler, I'll tell you now that what we read in Obadiah is ultimately about the end times. And when we get to it, I'll tell you why we can know this. So in verse 2, we have God pronounce his judgment of doom over Edom. I am making you the least of all nations. You will be beneath contempt. Now, unfortunately, the complete Jewish Bible leaves out the opening word of this verse as we find it in the Hebrew Scriptures. That word is hine, which means behold. It's a word that says, listen up. It means that something unexpected, even world-changing, is about to be announced. The event is that Edom is going to transform from significant to insignificant. So it's not that the nations are going to attack Edom in order that it become insignificant. It is that Edom is already insignificant. She is weak, vulnerable, not respected, and so is worthy now of attack. In fact, the final words of verse 2 say that God will make Edom beneath contempt or perhaps maybe despised among the nations. Now, how exactly Edom becomes this pariah to the world is not explained. 
we must always be careful to realize that geopolitics and tangible events in the real world will be what leads to everything predicted in the Bible. It will all bring it all into being. We, we don't know what these will be, but the approximate when of it, we can know. It is going to be near or at the end times, and we're going to get a better idea of this a little bit later in Obadiah. Just keep one thing in mind as you keep one eye on the world around you today. Biblical Edom is modern day Jordan. And already, Jordan has descended into a poor and weak nation without much hope of regaining their lost luster. A nation that is not currently highly regarded among the nations of the world. Not despised just yet, but certainly not among the nations with any actual influence. We'll talk about Jordan again in a few minutes. Well, what happened to Edom that opened the door to their downfall? Verse 3 says something proverbial. Your proud heart has deceived you. You whose homes are caves in the cliffs, who live on the heights, and you say to yourselves, who can bring me down to the ground? Pride. Pride. The Proverbs are full of warnings about the eventual result of pride, with one of the outcomes as becoming self-deceived. That is, one attaches more important to oneself and has a higher estimation of oneself than merited. And biblically, it means that rather than giving God the glory for the blessings and abundance He has given to you, you give that glory to yourself. This is deception. Now, I want to pause just a moment to remind you of something I've taught on before. A proud heart means a proud mind. The Hebrew word is lev, and indeed it does properly translate as heart. However, in the ancient world, no culture knew of the functions of the brain. Rather, what they Today, what we today know takes place in the brain, they thought took place in the heart muscle. They thought that intellectual ability and reason and discernment and memory, the human will, and more took place in the heart. The Greeks thought that as well. And as societies and knowledge have evolved, despite us knowing better, we still tend to ascribe emotions, especially love as a function of the heart. And this has led to the typical Christian view that love is an emotion that lives in the heart. Or it is to our heart that the Holy Spirit speaks. And so when the Bible speaks of the heart, it's speaking of where love resides and divine spiritual guidance and instruction occur. One of the better things a Bible student can do is simply cross out the word heart. Whenever we encounter it in our Bibles and insert in its place the word mind. So Edom will develop a proud mind, an overestimation of itself, which is a false reality that will lead to their sudden downfall. Now, the second half of verse three is full of all kinds of hidden implications that shows up when we approach it using the Hebrew study technique called remez, which means looking beneath the plain meaning of the words. That is, it's something hinted at, or there are some vague connections that we would do well to notice. When one goes to the Dead Sea and looks to the east, we see mountains. Now, these mountains are full of cliffs and caves and crags. And so many people living in Edom lived in these places on the mountains where they were more protected. 
and it gave them a vantage point where they could see an enemy approaching from far off. And because they feel so protected, they think, who, we who live on <clears throat> the heights and say to ourselves, who can bring us down to the ground? Now, the Hebrew words for heights are probably better lofty, is ma'on. And this word indeed can mean the heights of mountains. But this is also used biblically to refer to the cosmic heights, the place where God lives, the place where the angels roam. Therefore, it is also where the divine council resides and administrates the whole of heaven. There is a connection we need to see. And so very often in the Bible, such connections are subtle because a specific Hebrew phrase or word is used in one place, but only rarely anywhere else. So when we see that rare word or phrase appear, there is some likelihood of an earlier connection. Now, Edom is depicted as proud of heart and therefore wicked. So are a certain members of the divine council depicted as proud of heart and therefore wicked. Is there someone in the divine council that the Bible tells us is judged by God for their pride? Anybody think of any, who that might be? And then in verse 3 of Obadiah, we see a rhetorical Edom say that since they are dwelling on high, who can bring them down to the ground? The word is Eretz, which means earth. Listen to Isaiah 14, 13 through 20, and then think about what we just read in Edom, about uh, Edom in Obadiah. It says, you thought to yourself, I will scale the heavens. I will raise my throne above God's stars. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly far away in the north. I will rise past the tops of the clouds. I'll make myself like the Most High. Instead, you are brought down to Sheol, to the uttermost depths, uttermost depths of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you, reflecting on what has become of you. Is this the man who shook the earth, who made kingdoms tremble, who made the world a desert, who destroyed its cities, who would not set his prisoners free? All of the kings of the nations, all of them lie in glory, each in his tomb. But you are discarded, unburied, like a loathed branch, clothed like the slain who were pierced by the sword. They fall to the stones inside a pit, like a corpse, to be trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with those kings in the grave. Because you destroyed your own land, you have brought death to your own people, the descendants of evildoers will be utterly forgotten. I mean, can you hear the same sort of thought pattern in Isaiah as we find in Obadiah? Often this Isaiah passage is said to be speaking about when Lucifer rebelled in the heights of heaven and as a consequence was cast to the earth, to the ground, to the Eretz. It probably makes more sense, although we can't be certain of it. If this is not Lucifer, it's not Satan, but rather it's a member or members of the divine council. Since the scriptures say that God regarded some of them as having become wicked and corrupt, back in Psalm 82. In fact, this view that it was Satan that is being described in Isaiah didn't even come until much later in history. Now, the Jewish encyclopedia states that the myth concerning the morning star was transferred to Satan by the first century BC, citing in support of this view ancient documents named The Life of Adam and Eve and the Book of Enoch. Or as Satan El is described as having been one of the archangels. And because he contrived to make his throne higher than the clouds over the earth and resembles and resemble my power on high, Sataniel, Satan, was hurled down 
with his angels. And since then, he's been flying in the air continually above the abyss. According to Jewish thought, the passage in Isaiah was used to prophesy the fate of the king of Babylon, who is also described as aiming to rival God. Either way, the point is, the vocabulary and tone used in Obadiah reminds the mindful reader of Isaiah 14, and certainly would have reminded the Hebrews alive in the Old Testament era. So we see Edom and this divine but wicked spiritual being in heaven from Isaiah as but two peas in the same pod, as my grandmother used to say. That is, there is a direct and unmistakable likeness in their character, their nature, their desires, and so in their fates. This is further proof of the concept I call the reality of duality that makes a direct link between what goes on in heaven with what happens on earth in a kind of mirrored reaction. God dealt with a rebellion in his heavenly family. That's what we read about, Psalm 82. So he will have no hesitation in dealing with rebellion in his earthly non-covenant family, Isaac's offspring, Esau. Thus God responds to Edom's arrogance in verse 4. If you make your nest as high as an eagle's, even if you place it among the stars, I'll bring you down from there. So says Jehovah, it doesn't matter how high up in those mountains you build your villages and your defenses. You certainly can't build them up at the dizzying heights that eagles do. And of course you can't place them up in the high heavens where the stars reside. But again, remember the vocabulary and the linkages being made. Stars are, of course, those luminous objects in the sky, but stars are also a term for angels. There was still a belief floating in the background that those thousands of lights up in the night sky were angels. So, God has already shown that he can put down rebels from heaven, so doing the same to Edom is, by comparison, child's play. Now, verse 5 sounds a little odd on the surface, but the meaning quickly reveals itself. This speaks of the thieves that come in the night and grape pickers coming at harvest time. This is a metaphor. The idea is that when a thief comes in the night, he'll take what he wants and stop. When he is satisfied, he has enough. Normally, a grape picker will not pluck every grape at harvest time, but will intentionally leave some clusters. The thieves stop robbing because they can neither use nor carry anymore. Grape pickers leave some clusters so that the gleaners can come later and get some grapes for themselves. Both actions, in their own ways, are actually merciful. However, God will show Edom no such mercy. Edom will be stripped bare. They'll lose everything. Now, let's remember that God is not going to supernaturally attack Edom and supernaturally take their possessions away from them. Rather, the divine council members are going to whisper into the souls of the national leaders they have charge over to do that job on God's behalf. Certainly, these national leaders' motives to attack Edom is no such thing. They'll each have their own. But the effect is going to be the same. The nations are doing God's will, just as Assyria did God's will in conquering the northern kingdom, and Babylon did God's will in conquering the southern kingdom. God was using Assyria and later Babylon to punish his people. See, he always uses nations and individuals to bring about his will on earth, whether it's to bless or it's to curse. Verse 7 continues this thought. 
Your allies went with you only to the border. Those at peace with you deceived and defeated you. Those who ate your food set a trap for you, and you couldn't discern it. Edom, even in the time of the kings, was nowhere near a match militarily for its neighbors. It saw its only hope was to form alliances with stronger countries. Sadly, Edom made an alliance with Babylon. Now, on the one hand, this alliance offered the greatest protection for Edom, but there is always an on the other hand in matters like this. Babylon did not offer an allegiance out of the goodness of their hearts. So when Babylon began to raid Judah, they demanded that Edom join them due to Edom's proximity to Judah. This is what happens when you make a deal with the devil. Oh, you may get some earthly, or rather, early benefit, but in time, you're going to pay a steep price. As a current example of this, I cannot help but think in our modern times about a good portion of Europe making an energy alliance with their longtime enemy, Russia. Europe, always energy starved, could only see the short term benefit of such a dangerous step. And their politicians deceived themselves and their citizens into thinking that Russia would become more docile and agreeable over time, and with this energy alliance that they saw as beneficial to all parties. And as history has quickly shown, Russia used that reliance as a chess piece to exert control. They attacked Ukraine, set off a war that dragged Europe into a lose-lose situation. Russia's calculus was that Europe would cave in and look the other way so that they wouldn't lose their primary energy source. But Europe ultimately concluded they couldn't support Russia's aggression or Ukraine would be lost along with their enormous grain supplies, as well as providing a huge geographical buffer between a large part of Europe and Russia. They crossed their fingers. They hoped that if they supported Ukraine only with money and supplies, then Russia wouldn't cut off that energy supply that Europe had formed all of their energy policy around. And we're now captive to it. Because Russia, too, was enjoying the benefit of the enormous income that selling that energy produced for them. So now, caught in a catch 22, Europe had to support Ukraine, but Russia responded angrily by cutting off their oil and gas exports to Europe. This did and continues to do the greatest harm to Europe's economy because the price of energy went way up even further than it had ever been before. And it was already sky high compared to the USA and other parts of the world. Edom found itself in the same impossible position after forming their alliance with Babylon. Now, they were no doubt reluctant to join Babylon in fighting Judah. But what choice did they have now? If they reneged on that alliance, Babylon would surely have turned their fury towards them, and Edom would have become merely a vassal state. It seems that in the near future, this is again going to happen to Edom, to Jordan, that is modern day Edom. Those who they trusted, probably fought alongside are now going to see them as easy pickings. They'll turn on them and decimate them. I have no idea how that might happen, except for one thing. And I admit this is only based on conditions that as exist today, not knowing how they might change over time. My speculation is this. Jordan is host. The thousands and thousands 
of Palestinians who moved there decades ago, many of whom still live in camps, some of them since the 1960s. These folks who were living in Israel, side by side with the Jews, left at the behest of the Arab League, Jordan included, when they declared they wanted, were going to use their combined militaries to attack Israel and wipe them off the map. The League wanted the Israeli Arabs to be safe, so they enticed them to leave by promising them that the war would be short and once over, they could return to their homes in Israel or to any formerly Jewish home they liked. At that time, Jordan's territory extended to well past the Jordan River to the west. Many of the Arab evacuees went to this part of Jordan. Many others relocated on the east side of the river in Jordan proper. The long and the short of it is, the Arab League lost their war with Israel, and Jordan wound up with hundreds of thousands of refugees on their hands. Further, Jordan lost its territory on the west side of the river to Israel, a place now famously known as the West Bank. And in a relatively short time, an Islamic faction called the PLO, led by the infamous terrorist Yasser Arafat, took over the West Bank refugee camp as a gangster takes over a neighborhood. But when Arafat was forced out of the West Bank, he naturally went to the remaining part of Jordan to the east, and he tried to take over the giant encampments there. He fomented trouble, and then along with thousands of those people, now called Palestinians, tried in 1970 to overthrow Jordan's government in a bloodbath that became known as Black September. He lost. He was arrested. He was expelled back to the West Bank where he harassed Israel. Jordan is now a poorer nation. Their military adventurism having cost them dearly. And within their ancient Edomite territorial heritage, they have few natural resources. The Palestinians living in Jordan are mostly poverty stricken. And the Jordanians really don't want them there, but no one else will take them in. There are far too jobs in Jordan for the native Jordanians. And Jordan has to provide much support and free services to these thousands of Palestinians who live permanently as a people without a country. I suspect that the now much weaker Jordan, who isn't particularly liked, by the way, by the other Muslim nations, is soon going to find itself under attack by these Palestinian refugees who have no hope but who might become desperate enough to why it went to try to turn Jordan into a Palestinian state, run by either Fatah or Hamas, whom they mostly identify with. I really admit this is speculation, and it might not be the situation that is the catalyst for Jordan's downfall, but it will be some type of real-world circumstance like the one I just described that festers and festers until it finally boils over. That's how things happen. Verse 8 says, When that day comes, says Adonai, won't I destroy all the wise men of Edom and leave no discernment on Mount Esau? This is the scenario I was just speaking about. Jordan, Edom, is going to, probably already has, backed itself into a corner. It has no idea how to extricate itself from their predicament. They are a kingdom ruled by a king. And like most kings, he unilaterally decides on his nation's policies and cannot allow too much dissent in the government so the wisest of his men are not heeded. So Jordan is not well regarded. 
by either, by either the West or the East. Even a few years ago when the king realized that, ironically enough, making a friend of Israel, rather making, making Israel a friend rather than an enemy would be the best course of action, his Arab neighbors warned him against it. And it also set off a number of Palestinian terrorist actions in his own nation. So he had to abandon that strategy. Now he gets no help from his Arab neighbors, and he also has an unneeded adversarial relationship with Israel that he really doesn't want in order to placate the Muslim world. What a mess. See, this verse also points up that ancient Edom went by a number of different names, with Mount Esau, or perhaps it's the mountains of Esau, as one. Edom was also known by the names Esau and Mount Seir, as well as just Seir. So don't get confused by all these different names we find in the Bible concerning Edom. They all mean the same place. Now, please also notice the opening words, when that day comes. Now, most Bible translators will correctly capitalize the word day because it is but an abbreviation for the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a time of God's wrath. There have been a few days of the Lord in Bible history, but the next one seems to be an in times event and it is in the context of God's wrath being poured out upon the Gentile nations of the earth, Edom included. And here in Obadiah, we need to take Edom as indicating not only the specific nation of Edom, meaning Jordan, but also as more or less rep representative of all the nations of the world. See, the only nation on earth that is not a Gentile nation is Israel. Similarly, as Babylon is used to represent all nations in the New Testament. So let, let me just sum up what we know so far. The book begins with Obadiah as a witness to what God is saying to someone in heaven, probably to the divine council. The message is an oracle and an instruction about Edom, but also to a degree it's about Edom as a collective whole that represents the condition and the fate of all the nations of the earth, except for Israel. Jehovah is going to send this word to the world leaders to attack Edom through his divine beings that populate his divine council. Edom will already be as little or nothing of importance to the world, so the nations will have some other motivation to attack her that is not yet apparent to us. Edom doesn't believe it. They believe they're still invulnerable and strong. God says that it is Edom's deceived mind that makes them think this way. Doesn't matter. God himself is going to bring them down using the world's nations to do so, so what Edom thinks of itself is irrelevant. Jehovah uses vocabulary to bring to mind the corruption of his divine counsel in heaven and then correlates it with the corruption that is eaten away at the mind of Edom and of all nations for that matter. The divine counsel is part of God's heavenly family. Edom is part of his earthly family as descended from Abraham and Isaac, but just not the part that is the covenant people. Oh, how key that is. First, it seems that Edom is going to be either attacked from an internal enemy that they are just too unwise to suspect, or from an ally that they foolishly trust. Later, more nations will join in, and the result will be complete decimation. Even worse than if a robber broke into a house and stole everything, or as though grape harvesters harvested so thoroughly they left nothing for the poor to claim. 
While this no doubt happened in some form in prior history, probably around the time of the kings, maybe again even later, the final, the most savage attack that ends Edom as a viable nation will be at the end times day of the Lord. Okay, we'll continue with Obadiah next week. For more teachings of real Bible study and to rediscover God's Word with Tom Bradford, visit Torah Class today on the web, streaming TV, or download the Torah Class mobile app.